Welcome back to Atlanta Diaries, the place where meaningful conversations with breakthrough women come to life. Today, I have the honor of sharing retired Lieutenant Colonel Crystal Turner Chai's inspiring journey. Crystal served as a Pennsylvania State Police Trooper for 25 years and was the first African American female to command a troop and the second African American female to obtain the rank of major. She earned a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Elizabethtown College and a master's degree from Central Penn College. Crystal is also a graduate of the Northwestern School of Police Staff and Command and the FBI National Academy. She has been the recipient of numerous awards, including an honorary doctorate of Humane Letters from Central Penn College and the Harrisburg's Regional Chamber. Crystal retired very recently but continues her dedication to the community and is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Hi, Crystal. A very warm welcome to Atlanta Diaries. Thank you so much. I think it's so amazing to be the first African-American woman in the department's 116-year history to attain the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. How did you feel at that time and what kind of emotions did you go through? It was very emotional because I had met the first African-American female major in the agency when I was very young. And so she was actually the highest ranking at that time, Major Virginia Smith Elliott. She was so kind and very open when I met her. And so when I achieved the rank of major, I remember calling a friend of mine and asking them if they would have her come to my ceremony as major, because I wanted people to know and recognize that she was the first. And I was so moved that she basically gave up her time to come to my ceremony. And and then achieving the rank of lieutenant colonel was truly almost out of body experience because I can remember standing back and kind of reviewing my whole entire career with the agency because it was so tough in the academy that, hey, I'm good now. I just want to get my gun, my rounds and my big hat and I want to go to my calls and I'm happy. Yeah, it takes a lot of guts and courage to go through the journey that you did. So let's backtrack a little bit. So from Moxville, North Carolina to the concrete streets of the Bronx, Share with us, how did your early years shape your journey? Wow, Moxville, North Carolina, that's where I was born. And what I remember most about Moxville is red dirt and one traffic light. I remember loving kindergarten, just leaving the house and going to school. And, you know, didn't really know much outside of Moxville, but my aunt, she was VA nurse. I always thought she was so just amazing. And she traveled and she flew on planes and I remember always going to visit her. She would take me on trips. I remember we were very poor. She spoke to my mother and she said, hey, why don't you let me help you out? And I'll take Crystal to New York and I'll get her in school. And this will give you an opportunity to get on your feet. And my mom agreed. Knowing my mom now, I'm shocked that she agreed. And all I remember is them putting me on a plane somewhere in North Carolina. I had a little note attached to my outfit and the stewardess took care of me on the flight. And my aunt was there to pick me up and whisk me off to New York. And I was like, wow, no red dirt. And we lived in a high rise building. And that was the first time I got on an elevator and I had my own room. (laughs) And it was so life changing for me. That's where I learned how to eat in restaurants. We always went to museums and we went to the beach. And that's where my eyes really got open to different people, diversity, Asian, Hispanic, Middle Eastern. All of those people lived in our neighborhood. I went to first grade and it was great. Wow. We take so many things for granted, right? Literally going to a restaurant, just going on a plane. Many people might not be able to even relate to this. Yeah. The next word which comes to my mind, of course, is gratitude. So, Crystal, what changed after that? I I excelled at school and I loved learning. Every single day was different. And while I was in the Bronx, New York, just as my aunt kind of hoped that my mom would do, or at least gave her the opportunity to do, is she started to land on her feet, get to a point where she could take care of her children. And my mom married a guy who worked in construction. His construction work brought him to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And when they moved here to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, she came to my aunt and said, I'm ready to take Crystal back. And I wasn't happy about it. (laughs) I can imagine. Yeah. I was not 
happy at all. Leaving my aunt, we were super close and just learning so much in New York City. And so when I got here to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I have siblings. So I have a brother and a sister. And we moved into what they call here, they call it row homes. It was five of us. My sister and I shared a bedroom. And so now I got to start all over again. I got to get indoctrinated to this new school system. Harrisburg was tough for us because, like I said, my mom was just landing on her feet. She had gotten a job at Pomeroy's the department store here in Harrisburg. But she was also dealing with a husband that was older and expected certain things from the wife. You'd be at home, you cook, clean. How dare you get your own money? How dare you want for anything that I don't give you? So she was going through things with him, which was getting passed down to us, the children, and me, especially because I was the oldest child. But I still love going to school. Now that I think back, as now that I'm older and a little bit wiser and seasoned, I think for me, school was escape, right? where I could go and kind of forget all the other things that were happening in the home and focus on me. So, and not so much my siblings and keeping the house clean and not making my mother angry because God only knows what she had gone through with her husband at that time. Yep. Hmm. I know you mentioned that you took on the role of a caregiver for your sister and brother and made peace with lots of uncomfortable, unsafe situations, right? I'm a child of sexual abuse and physical abuse. And because I was the oldest, I ended up getting the brunt of discipline. And when you are attempting to keep everybody else safe, you know, it's difficult. It's very difficult on you. And trauma reflects itself in all different kinds of ways. And when I was a young girl, I kept everything inside. And here, um, the way I dealt with trauma is I would bite the skin off of these knuckles. And um my God. Mm. Uh, excuse me. And so that was the way that I would get through my days. And people would be like, Why do you bite the skin off your knuckles? What was interesting was adults didn't recognize that I was holding something in and it was a trauma response, but they couldn't see deeper past why. And I didn't even really know why, because I'm a child. So as I got older, I got into sports. I was very athletic. It was another way for me not to be at home because you'd have practice, you get home, you might have dinner. I had chores to do. So usually I'm washing dishes by 9, 930. Hopefully I'm able to go to bed and be left alone, you know. And then on weekends, you had to practice. So again, you escaped out of the house. So sorry to hear all this, Crystal. But I can see that in this horrible suffering, you did come out a winner, right? So kind of you to say, and I do believe that I did come out a winner. I believe has given me an ability to be able to see beyond some other people and their trauma and the way their responses. And so I'm always conscious of sometimes the way that people respond or the way people present themselves isn't the way they intend to present themselves, right? And so we need to be able to look beyond what is the first impression, almost looking past or through the mirror, I should say, and then say, wait a minute, I recognize that or I feel that I'm one of those people. So I've utilized that in my time as I've moved through the Pennsylvania State Police also. You could have easily chosen to say, I went through this shit and I want to pass it on. You know, I mean, when I think about boarding schools, I think of the book, Lord of the Flies, but you chose to don the empathetic hat and made sure the other person doesn't go through this. So that's amazing. Yeah. Crystal, so you did make it to college, but the family ran out of money. Yeah. My mom was had a high school education and my stepdad, he couldn't read and write. And so my mother didn't understand grants and loans and how to get people beyond high school. And I didn't either. I was just trying to get out of high school and understand the trauma I was going through was starting to affect me from the educational standpoint, too, where I might have had A's, but then I would end up with a B because I was dealing with something emotional and whatever was going on in the house at that time. So I went to college, but the first year as a freshman year, we squeaked by because we filled out the forms for grants and loans. But the second year, my mother was under the impression that you filled it out one time. 
and then we're just rolling, rolling, rolling. We didn't understand that we needed to continually fill out this paperwork. And so when I went back for the sophomore year, it turned out that I ran out of money in that first semester. And so nothing more embarrassing than coming back to your dorm room. And there's a big note on your door that says, you need to contact your financial aid office. And so when I contact them, they're saying, you need to pay this, you need to pay it by search for the date, or you're going to have to leave. So I called home and told my mom, and I was like, mom, I said, I got this notice. And she said, yeah, they sent one here too. And I said, any way we're going to be able to get it? She says, nope, nope, I guess you're going to have to leave. So I was devastated. You know, in my senior year in high school, I worked four hours at school and four hours I had a job. I had saved money, you know, just so I could buy books. I had bought my own little car and everything. I had a part-time job at college too. And it just wasn't enough. There's nothing worse than packing up your stuff. Because I remember asking, can I just stay the second semester? Because I figured it would be less embarrassing when everybody goes home than to leave, you know, mid-year. They were like, no. And I was just crying the whole way home. And as soon as I hit the door, my mom's house, well, you're going to stay here. You know, you got to get a job. And I was like, yeah, I know. So I went and got a job in a a little place called Quaker Oats in Doran Security. The people that sit at the little guard shack or when you drive in and sign you in visitors. And that was me. And you did laps around the building every so often. And so I did that for a while until I had gotten sick that time, security job, you take off sick, you don't get paid. I couldn't afford it. So I took some medicine and uh, I'm sitting at the guard shack and I must have dozed off. And when I woke up, next thing I knew, I looked up and one of the higher ups, the big wigs that worked at Quaker Rose was looking at me in the window. And I go, oh, sorry, you know, and I let him in. And I knew that that very next day that they were going to tell me that I was terminated. And they did. I was fortunate, though, because I was looking for another job while I was working at Quaker Oats. And I just didn't tell them that I had gotten another job at Dauphin County Prison. I was just waiting to the two weeks time so I could say, here's my notice and I'm going to quit. So the county prison was for more money or was there something else which was sort of motivating you to go to that area of work? The prison was more money. I would, could take off and get paid. Sick time, I had sick leave, and there was a lot of overtime. So my thought was, even though they kicked me out of school, they was like, oh, you got to pay these student loan back. So bills were mounting. So getting into the prison, I figured I could learn some sort of skill that would lend me a little bit more credence as I'm moving through life. It's funny though, but I remember when I was heading back to college, I'm on the turnpike and I was speeding. I was. <laughs> and I see the light in the back. Woo-woo, and I'm like, oh, sh-. so I get pulled over and, you know, I do everything that I'm taught to do, 10 and 2. And the police officer steps out, walks up to my car, leans down. He's got this great big old hat on. And I see the patch on his arm, Pennsylvania State Police. And he called me ma'am. And I said, ma'am, I'd never been called a ma'am from any police officer I had ever met. And he says, do you know I stopped you? And I lied. I said, no. (laughs) And he said, you were speeding. I knew that, but I was like, oh. And he says, license registration, insurance. If everything checks out with your license, you know, I'll give you a ticket and you'll be on your way. And the whole time I'm like, Pennsylvania State Police, who are they? I quickly write down like Pennsylvania State Police, trying to keep from moving too much because that's what we're taught. He comes back and I'm still thinking maybe he'll give me a break, you know, because I said I was going to college thinking he might say, well, she don't have a lot of money, but he did not. But when he gave me the ticket, he says, have a nice day. And I remember looking at his uniform and how clean and crisp it was going back to the car. I said, I'm going to find out who these Pennsylvania State Police troopers are. So I drive back to college. We didn't have Google, Wikipedia. I actually go to the library and look up the Pennsylvania State Police. I find out that the first Black trooper came on in 1954. And I said, well, do they have any females? And they had this picture of one Black female. She came in in 1973, and her name was Verna Dorsey. And I said, wow. And I remember looking in the Sunday newspaper, and they had this big ad for the Pennsylvania State Police. I thought the salary was a lot at that point. It was like 30 some thousand. And I was like, whoa. And it talked about how great they were, the first and finest state police organization. 
And I just remember the encounter that I had with this one trooper on the side of the road and how kind he was to me that day. He gave me a ticket. He did a job, but he was kind to me. I was like, you know, I think I want to try them out. And so just kind of fleeting thought, nothing big. When I left school, I remember coming back home, working a security job, and I applied for the Pennsylvania State Police. But at that time, I didn't score high enough to move forward in the written exam. So when I left Quaker Oats, the security job, and then went to the prison, I was like, well, at least I'll get to the prison and I'll have some more experience, you know, from a law enforcement standpoint. So that's how I ended up segueing into the county prison. So the prison experience, was it what you expected? Was it any different? The prison experience, listen, I have lifelong friends from the prison and I learned the the best place to hone your communication skills was in that prison because you didn't have a weapon, right? All we had was, they called body alarms, a little red one-way radio that you would hit and it would emit a loud high-pitched signal that would alert in the control room to let people know, A, emergency, Crystal needs help. And so it taught you how to be a good communicator. So, you know, I think about my journey to the Pennsylvania State Police and every layer, right, from childhood up through, prepared me to become the deputy commissioner. Listen, a county prison is for people that have sentences usually two years and below, but it is also a place where people that have gotten charged with, be it felonies, misdemeanors, or whatever, that they're going to go and sit there until they're actually sentenced. So it could be rape, robbery, murder. It could be shoplifting, trespassing. And in a smaller environment, and you have to be able to navigate that. And it really comes down to what type of person are you? Are you the type of person that comes in and feels like, hey, I'm in charge, you're going to do as I say and not as I do? Or are you going to be that type of person that's going to show some empathy and talk to people and get people to follow the rules because it's the right thing to do for the body, right? So we can do it in a way that everybody is able to do it, or you can do it in a way where you're going to get in a position where people are going to be locked down, there's people who are going to go against the things that you say, and you're going to have problems. Who wants to have problems? You go into the prison, you're in there for eight solid hours. We used to get drafted. So sometimes it'd be eight to 16 hours a day, okay? In that prison, when that gate shut, boom, you couldn't leave. You either brought your lunch or you ate what was made for you at the prison by the inmates. You don't want to do that. But for eight to 16 hours a day, dealing with people who were not very happy, felt as if no one cared about them, why would you want to come in and make their day even worse, which eventually is going to slide off on you? So I wouldn't try to make anybody's day any worse than what it could be. I just tried to treat people, if I were behind the bars, how would I want to be treated that day? And that's the way I would treat people. When I became a trooper and I was on a traffic stop, right on Interstate 83. And I got a guy pulled over and I'm doing my thing and a car pulls in behind me. And what we're taught is that when you're out on a traffic stop, you don't want people pulling in behind you because you don't know who they are. It could be a dangerous situation. So I remember was car pulling behind me and I was looking and I was like, sir, hold on a second. Can you just pull over here? And all of a sudden his head leans out the window. Miss Crystal, hi, hey. And he said his name and he says, and I go, oh, hey, how you doing? And he goes, you all right? I did. I chuckled a little bit and I said, I'm okay. He said, well, I'm going to stay right here to make sure you good. Oh, <laughs> this guy that I first met at Dolphin County Prison backed me up on a traffic stop. Listen, the things that went through my head was, wow, I must have really treated that person with dignity and respect. For him to not only stop, but tell me he's going to wait just to make sure I was okay. Wow. Crystal, so when you were in the prison or when you were looking after those inmates, so there was never anger? Like you were there, you deserve it. Never any anger. Now, listen, there are people that came in with charges that I don't agree with. Especially, and I told you this, going through my own traumas, child molestation, sexual assault, rape, those types of things. Anything involving a child. That will wear me out. But I am not judge jury, right? That was not my role. My role was to ensure that you got 
the things that you needed, that you were safe, that you were fed, that you needed medical assistance. And so I would just put myself in the position of that person that I was tending to. I would seek to understand. Now, listen, there were some days in there that were just hell on wheels. There's days when people are just nasty for no reason. But I also recognize that I am working through my own issues. And so I don't intend to be you. I want to move past my own traumas. And the only way for me to move past my own traumas is to seek to understand and understand what I don't want, right? That makes sense. So tell us now for your journey from the county prison to the best part of your life, if I can say that. So the county prison was very interesting. Like I said, it was good times, but there was a lot of sadness for me because I still hadn't gotten back to college. Bills kept mounting. I fooled around and got married. So that fell into some other things. You buy houses, you get yourself more in debt. And the whole time in the back of my brain is this whole state police. Remember, since I had been in the prison, I had applied two more times. So three times I had applied. I had turned 31. I'd gotten a letter from the Pennsylvania State Police telling me that, hey, since you turned 31, you're no longer eligible to become a Pennsylvania State Trooper because they had an age cut off. And I'm thinking, wow. So while I'm in the prison, the traumas that I'm going through manifest itself in overeating, depression, all those things. Let me tell you what I would eat. We had to be at work at 550. On the way to work, I would stop at Dunkin' Donuts. I'd get a coffee, two honey buns. The honey buns were probably the size of my head. They were huge. Then I would come in to the prison and stop at the vending machine, my favorite candy bar was Snickers. I'd get two of them. Now I got hot chocolate. Somebody would say, hey, my wife stopped going to bring lunch. Does anybody want anything? So I'd say, yeah, let me get a double with cheese. Okay, no onions, large fry, and a biggie drink. And it wasn't a diet. I'm probably 3,000 calories in, and it's barely 11 o'clock. Eat that. Didn't understand why I'm gaining this weight. When I'd get off work, if I got off on time, straight to Wendy's. I get the same order or I would go get a pizza, right? Now we got off at two. So I'd come home and eat that. I would take a nap, get up and then think I was still hungry. It's insane. So I had gained well over in excess of a hundred pounds and just was not in physical or mental shape at the prison. And so I remember the Teamsters Union came in and negotiated for us to get better health benefits. And with those health benefits, we got a free gym membership. Nice. (laughs) Listen, my friend Todd went to the gym on a regular basis. And so I went to Todd and I said, Todd, can you mentor me? He said, sure. So he took me under his wing and Todd and I started working out. So we'd be at the gym by 3, 3.30. We'd do our cardio in the morning, go home, shower, get to work. And fingers crossed, we got off work at two. And then after work, we go back to the gym. And that's when we would do our weightlifting. We met a nutritionist there who took a liking to us, who was amazing and taught me how to eat. She didn't charge me. It was amazing. Now I'm doing this for me now. I'm not doing this for the Pennsylvania State Police. Started to lose the weight, lost 70 pounds. Guess what comes in the mail? A letter from the Pennsylvania State Police. Somebody had filed some sort of complaint or a lawsuit, age discrimination, saying that, hey, it's illegal for you guys to discriminate against these people in their 30s. They can do this job. So they raised the cutoff age to 40. Nice. And they invited Mm -hmm. me back because now I had scored high enough on the written. I had scored high enough to be invited to the oral and the physical exams. Now I've been working out. And I remember telling Todd, hey, can we start working at the goals for the physical agility so that I'll be ready. So we started doing pull-ups and push-up, the running, the mile and a half. There it is. I got the call. So I went up to the Pennsylvania State Police on the day for the physical exam, killed it, knocked it out. Went up for the oral interview, knocked it out the park. Went up for the physical exam, knocked it out the park. And then it came time for a body fat, the pincher things. So they pulled me in. Women at that time, you had to have 24% body fat. I'm thinking I lost 70 pounds. I got to be okay. 
They put me in. My body fat was 27%. Oh, God. I looked at them and they said, no, you're not accepted, but we'll give you 30 days to get yourself down to 24% body fat. We'll bring you back and we'll test you. I drove home. I'm not going to lie. Before I drove home, because the test was right across the street from the Hershey Creamery, I went and I bought six cookies. I did. And I said, I'm having a cookie today. So I cried eating my cookies all the way home. But I called Todd because, you know, he was my workout partner. So I told him and I'm crying. And he said, Todd, he's such a good dude. When I told him they gave me 30 days, he said, well, what you going to do? He said, you got 30 days. What you going to do? He said, I'll see you at the gym tomorrow. I called him a name, but I'm not going to say it here. But I met him at the gym the next day and we got right back into it again. We went back to the nutritionist. She was disappointed too. She says, well, we can get you there, but it's going to be tough. And she gave me a new meal plan and I was up to almost two gallons of water and it was insanity. I'm not going to tell everybody what it is because when I tell you the results, everybody's going to want what the meal plan is and I can make millions, but I'm not going to tell you. And I remember saying to Todd, the next time I get body fat checked, we'll be at the academy. And so we went ahead. We did all of that work. I lost 30 pounds in 30 days. Crazy. Wow. Insanity. 30 pounds in 30 days. Mentally, I was strong because I knew what I wanted. Physically, very tired, very weak. I was like, I got to get to this 24% body fat. I will worry about everything else later. If you ask me how I did it, because I wasn't on a lot of carbs, I don't know. It had to be just sheer heart and willpower. I said, here comes the body fat. They go in. I remember the person taking my body fat. And she says, wow, what you been doing? And I said, you don't want to know, but I know that I want to be here. So let's get this over with. So she went ahead and checked my body fat. And I was at 23% body fat. Oh, my God. And I was so excited. And they gave me the letter. And they said, you got to report in two weeks. And all I could think of was, I got to call Todd. I got to go Todd. And I come out of there, out of the academy. And I'm so excited. And I went right back to the creamery and got me six more cookies. I love that. You deserve those. (laughs) When I called him this time, I wasn't crying. I was excited. And uh, I said, we made it. I'm on my way. But listen, I was still nervous about here. I had a steady job with the county. I had been there almost nine years with the prison. And now I'm moving on to this new job with the state police. I said, Todd, I'm going to tell him I'm taking two weeks vacation. I said, so in case I change my mind, but if I don't change my mind, I'm going to give you all my uniforms and everything to turn in for me, you know, just in case. And so uh, I reported to that academy in two weeks. Two weeks after that, I called Todd on the phone and we put our plan in place. I had written out a resignation and everything already. And all he needed to do was put the date on it with my uniforms. And that was it. Wow. What a story, Crystal. That's crazy. Yeah. (laughs) And I remember being so nervous because you lose that weight. And I was like, I can't gain this weight back because on the day that you go in, you have to do the test all over again. And I said, I'm going to have these cookies, but I got to be careful because as soon as I get back, I got to do this test again. So what was your fear which stopped you from resigning immediately? My fear was not being able to do whatever it is the requirements were at the state police. I was afraid that I just wouldn't be good enough. Even though I had did all that work and I wanted to be a trooper so badly, I still doubted that I would be able to do the job or the training and there's testing and all those things. And I was fearful of that. And I wanted to see if I could make it. So what gave you the confidence then that you are capable of doing it? We started with 88 cadets. I was the only Black female. There was another Black male there. And there were three other women there. So it was only four women out of 88. And two minorities, well, three, because we had Sanchez, Hispanic. And I remember being at that academy and I saw a Black female lieutenant. And she was walking through the hallways, encouraging people when she could. And I remember looking at her and seeing myself. And I said, she can do it. I can do it. And I decided I wasn't leaving. 
Beautiful. So let's shift gears, Crystal. Yeah. Tell me what were your joys in your journey as a state trooper? I remember family and friends coming up to see me graduate and the joy in their faces to see me graduate from such an esteemed place because I was representing Harrisburg and people just telling me how proud they were to see me graduate. And at that time, I had a younger brother. He's Arnell. He's 22 or 23 years younger than me. To see him or see me graduate from there, that was one of the joys of becoming a trooper. And I remember my first supervisor was a Black male. And he was tough on me, but he was almost like a father figure, like telling me do's and don'ts, looking out for me. I remember I hurt my back because I was still working out and I was on probation. And I was like so deathly afraid of taking off because you want to be there to support your brother and sister trooper. But I could barely wear my gun belt at that point. But I came to work and he saw me and he goes, what the F is wrong with you? And I almost started crying. I saw I hurt my back. And I said, I don't want to take off. I said, I, I don't want to let the troopers down. He said, are you crazy? He said, you can't help us. Look at you. <laughs> and he said, this is how he talked. He said, take your ASS home. And I was so thankful because, listen, I grew up with people talking to me in that manner or worse. So that didn't bother me. You know, the fact that he cared enough to say, no, that's what your sick leave is for. You go home. Just that camaraderie and working with the guys and showing that I was not only capable, but I excelled as a state trooper where people didn't think that I was going to make it. I excelled. And just showing people that don't prejudge, don't make these assumptions about people because you don't know what they're made of, what's in here. And I enjoyed every moment of becoming a trooper and working with the men and women down there. And those were joys of mine. Any anecdotes come to your mind, Crystal? I remember we were at a call and we were going crazy, lights and sirens, you know, car was running from us. We were in a pursuit. And I remember we had to throw the stop stick. So we pull out, my partner throws the stop six. We jump back in the car. We get back into the pursuit and we end up catching the person. And I remember a little bit of a struggle with the person not wanting to go into custody. And I remember getting in there and whispering in a guy's ear and saying, you lost, you're not going to win. And I think when he heard me say uh, he wasn't going to win, he stopped fighting. Again, communication from the prison throughout my life to a situation where I'm there and I'm able to lean over in a guy's ear and say, it's over now. Stop. Crystal, did you ever feel that the physical strength of men, especially those in uniform, did it ever overwhelm you that they are stronger than you? Or were you ever made to feel that they were stronger than you? I think that just in training and the way people talk to us, you know, sometimes felt like, you're not that strong or you're not going to be able to beat this person or whatever. But I never went into situations thinking that way. As a matter of fact, in the Pennsylvania State Police, we box. Most of the time they put women against women. But every now and then you'll get that one instructor that says you're going to box the guys. And I never shied away from that. And matter of fact, I got the reputation of being somebody that hit pretty hard. And so, no, I never felt like from a physical standpoint of being intimidated by the guys, what bothered me more than the physical part was sometimes the mental part. You felt as if the men got the first choices and some of the better opportunities and things like that. Those are the things that would bother me because what we lack in physical strength, we make up a thousand times over in our mental abilities. I certainly have been in situations where I've had to go hands-on but I'm always thinking ahead. And so I'm thinking, okay, if someone's much bigger, then I'm going to go a little bit lower. I'm going to go for legs and things like that to get myself out of it. I know that I have other tools on my tool belt. I have pepper spray and I have a baton. And then for goodness sake, I got my brain in my mouth. Where I learned in the prison to be able to communicate, to talk people, I've talked more people in the handcuffs than I've ever done with my hands. So you sort of took it for granted. It's a given that men are stronger. Who cares? Understand it, accept it, and then use your other strengths is what I'm hearing. Yeah. I mean, 
God, women are the strongest. We're the smartest people on the planet. You bet. Yeah, totally. I created this community of amazing women. So I can say that and validate it with each and every conversation I've had. Absolutely. And again, like I said, we communicate our way through situations each and every day. That is one of the unique qualities that women possess. When I was recruiting for the Pennsylvania State Police, I would always tell women, what I need you for is what you have between your ears. And the emotional intelligence that we possess, my goodness, we've already won most of the time that we show up. And that's the way I would carry myself. I've already won. That would be one of the things I would say a lot of times. Hey, I don't want to give my uniform dirty. You see how good I look in this uniform. Let's just have a conversation, right? Because you're not going to win. You know that this is against the law, so you're probably going to get arrested for that. So let's not even have to be hands-on or anything because I got other people coming. Talk them into handcuffs a million times. Wow, that is such a powerful perspective, Crystal. Every leader, even on Atlanta Diaries, has said that in their own way, you know. I'm just remembering Nandini, who was a CEO of an advertising company. And uh, she was in the same organization for over 20 years, right? And when I asked her, how did you navigate that journey? She said that I had conversations with every single person. You know, I knew people were vying for my position or I knew that people could be wondering, why is she there and why not? We are there. It was all about conversation because we don't avoid conversation. We address. Yeah. And, you know, once we understand, we take egos out of play, right? And we can just all just kind of sit and try to understand points of view. Then we can come to an understanding. If we can just move ego, oh, my God, this world would be such a better place. So true. Absolutely. I want to talk a little bit more about the fact that physical strength didn't bother you, but what bothered you sometimes was discrimination. I have issues to this day with women being pigeonholed into positions that most people would think would be soft type of positions. If a woman wants to go into the crime room, her career track isn't always pushed in that avenue. Like she wants to be in the crime room. They'll be like, it's not available right now. Why don't you take this position over here in recruitment? Or why don't you take this position over here as a public information officer? Nothing wrong with any of those positions. And I held both of those positions. But what I would love to see is more women being driven into more operational roles and leadership roles where they are the leaders over crime scenes, over manhunts, things like that. Women are capable, they have the ability, and they should be allowed to move. And they should be mentored into those roles as well. And listen, there's not enough women in police or law enforcement. So you're not going to always have women mentors or role models. Men, okay, should take the lead and say, I see potential in her and mentor her in those areas because we need more women out there in the field to address some of the issues that are going on today. The empathy, the emotional intelligence that women possess, just the inherent ability to be able to communicate on every level to a point where people are not threatened. And if we could get more men to buy into that and not feel threatened when women are moving through and about agencies that have been historically dominated by men would be great. Were you able to make a breakthrough in any of those conversations? Were you able to push your way through in any roles which were stereotyped for men? Thankfully, yes. I am the first and only African-American female to held the position of troop commander in the Pennsylvania State Police. I was a troop commander in Troop Reading, and that was my best time in the Pennsylvania State Police. I absolutely loved being a troop commander. And it was a phenomenal station. Did you have to fight for that position or did it come to you? No, I had to fight for it. I had to keep asking for it, keep requesting to be considered for the position. And let me say this, the Pennsylvania State Police, that position in Troop L. Redding isn't the largest troop. It's not the smallest troop. And I earned the position. But I think I was considered for that position because there was another woman in the front office that advocated for me to have it. I believe that wholeheartedly. 
women need to advocate for other women. I had the credentials. I had the time and grade. I had, by now, y'all, we've gone 15 years. So now I got a bachelor's. I got a master's degree. I got Northwestern School of Police Staff and Training Command under my belt. So I got everything that's needed to be a true commander. And not to mention just the fact that I was just amazing. (laughs) I'm just kidding. No, I love it. (laughs) We haven't even spoken about that, Crystal, something which was always your dream. So how did you get yourself all those degrees? So when I finally got into the state police, got off probation and, you know, I had my groove. I was good. And I met this wonderful guy and I call him my brother. We're still friends to this day. And he was going back to college. And I remember him talking about, he says, yes, it's I got to take these uh, classes. And I said, what? Yeah. I said, where are you going? He said, Elizabethtown College. And I said, get out. I said, I want to go back. So he put me in touch with guidance counselor. I met with her. And next thing I know, I'm enrolled back in college, right? And so I'm going to work and I'm going to college. And I'm going to finally get this bachelor's degree, criminal justice from Elizabethtown College. But that wasn't enough for me. It sparked something in me. And I said, you know, I think I want to get my master's. And I said, I don't want to do criminal justice. And there's a school not far from where I live at. It's called Central Penn College. And they had a master's degree in organizational leadership. So I uh, signed on and decided to get my master's in organizational leadership. And that was been great, too. Never look back. And this person who was your friend you're talking about even now was also part of the Pennsylvania State Police? Yeah. He has since retired and gone on to bigger and greater things. He was a mentor and he was a man that took ego and pushed it to the side. Let me tell you, this guy's so great. He saw me, he says, hey, you're going to go places here. He was in charge of equal employment. And he said to me, when I move out of here, I want you to come in this spot. He said, you got to make the next rank. And he took me under his wing and taught me about EEO investigations. I went and got certified in the EEO investigations. And he said, all I want you to do is when you come here, I want you to take the office to the next level. So I did and loved my time at director of EEO because it allowed me to help people that were coming through. For instance, we had a gentleman, he had gotten disqualified from the process. We were disqualifying him because He lived in a neighborhood where people smoked marijuana in front of his home and he didn't report it. And I said, well, he's not the police. That's not his responsibility. And I said, he lives where he lives. I said, no, he shouldn't be disqualified for this. So I pull it, take it upstairs to the powers and was able to get it overturned. So just being able to look at those and say, no, and turn a no into a yes for somebody. Again, just being empathetic and looking at it with a fresh set of eyes and giving people a chance. Crystal, you spoke about gender discrimination, but did you also face any conscious or unconscious biases against you and Riz? Absolutely. I always wanted to be a troop commander, but there were opportunities for me to work in a station command. And I wasn't given those opportunities because The people in charge wanted their buddy to have that position. They were given to people that were less qualified than I was at the time. And it was very disappointing. I had the opportunity to go to the FBI National Academy when other people with less time and experience were afforded the opportunity to go there before me. And the FBI Academy is a very illustrious training that you would like to have, especially when you want to move forward and upward in agencies, not only in Pennsylvania State Police, but when you leave, like when I retired from Pennsylvania State Police, if I had a desire to be a chief or something like that, that's one of the qualifications that people look for. And to have me kind of sit the bench for seven years, I thought was very discriminatory and demeaning for lack of another term. But I decided I ain't quitting. I'm going to still be sitting right here waiting for you to tell me that I can go to the FBI Academy. And what happens? I go I excelled. I still have those friendships from the FBI Academy and I have the training. And that was conscious discrimination. I think it was color. I think it was female. And I think it was because of friendships. So what do you think helped you cope with this? What is it that really kept you going? What kept me going was 
knowing that there was someone always behind me that was watching me and watching how I handled these situations. I always wanted to open up a pathway for others to come in the door behind me and be that male, be that female, be that white, be that black. People need to understand that everybody has a different way that they lead and allow people to lead in however way that if the job gets done, the job gets done. I am very empathetic. I'm a people person. I knew my people's names. I knew their families, right? I had no problem with walking through the buildings and talking to people because I really genuinely want to know people. I buy lunches, all those things, because I recognize that it's not enough to say, oh, you got a job. Be happy you got a job. No, I'm happy that you're here and that we get to share time and space together and we get to solve problems together. That was more important to me than holding people's feet to the fire because they came in five minutes late. That never has been my thing. And since Atlanta Diaries is a place where aspiring women leaders learn and unlearn their definitions of success, love to hear your parting thoughts, your lessons for these young women today. Wow. Always remember who you are. Remember where you've come from. But most importantly, remember the impression that you're going to leave on other people. You don't know how you're impacting people until They've either told you or you see something in them later on. It could be just smiling, especially if you're in a leadership position and you smile and you remember their name that day, or you have a small conversation with them in an elevator. Just remember that they live and breathe just like you do. They have traumas. They have issues just like you do. And they're overcoming each and every day. And if you take the moment just to be a little bit empathetic, to show a little love and a little caring, you'll be surprised how far it goes. I love that. Thank you very much, Crystal. This was absolutely beautiful. Thank you for being a partner with me in this journey. Thank you for being a part of this incredible journey with Atlanta Diaries. I have had the privilege of hosting guests who courageously shared their most vulnerable selves with me. And even if only a small segment of these conversations can champion the journey of one person, it will be worth each and every moment. And together, we know we can create an even greater impact. So I do have a humble request for you. If you found value in these episodes, please consider sharing the podcast with your friends, family and on your social media. I would also love to hear your thoughts and will really appreciate if you could take a moment to leave a review or rating. See you next week for another inspiring journey on Atlanta Diaries.